Hello and welcome to Midday Connection on Tuesday, April 12th here from First Presbyterian Church of San Angelo. I'm Pastor Joel. And I'm Natalie. And we're here to do our Midday Connection. Uh, and we thought that we would do one every day for Holy Week as, as we're able to do so. But again, what we do is we read the daily lectionary texts for today and we talk about them a little bit and, uh, and then say a prayer. So let me go ahead and open us a word of prayer and then we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, gracious Lord, we are thankful to you. We're thankful for your love. We're thankful for your grace. We are thankful for this opportunity during Holy Week to reflect upon your word and be transformed by it. So I pray that we would be blessed in reading these words and that everybody that is listening would be blessed by hearing them. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would speak in and through us, that we would be all transformed more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. So we thank you and we praise you. And it is in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. So today we are starting with Psalm 34. Psalm 34. We'll get there in a second. Okay. One more page. There it is. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him, and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried, and was heard by the Lord, and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his holy ones. For those who fear him have no want. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Which of you desires life and covets many days to enjoy good? Keep your tongues from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord rescues them from them all. He keeps all their bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil brings death to the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no hope. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those who help, whose help is the Lord. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free, and the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Our Old Testament passage from Lamentations chapter 1 starting in verse 17 and going through the end of the chapter. Zion stretches out her hands, but there is no one to comfort her. The Lord has commanded against Jacob that his neighbors should become his foes. Jerusalem has become a filthy thing among them. The Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against his word. But hear all you peoples and behold my suffering. My young women and young men have gone into captivity. I have called to my lovers, but they deceived me. 
My priests and elders perished in the city while seeking food to revive their strength. See, O Lord, how distressed I am. My stomach churns. My heart is wrung within me because I have been very rebellious. In the street, the sword bereaves. In the house, it is like death. They heard how I was groaning with no one to comfort me. All my enemies hear of my trouble. They are glad that you have done it. Bring on the day you have announced and let them be as I am. Let all their evil doing come before you and deal with them as you have dealt with me because of all my transgressions. For my groans are many and my heart is faint. And from the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 22. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly, unbearably crushed that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, so that we would rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He who rescued us from so deadly a peril will continue to rescue us. On him we have set our hope that he will rescue us again, as you also join in helping us by your prayers, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Indeed, this is our boast, the testimony of our conscience. We have behaved in the world with frankness and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and all the more toward you. For we write, and nothing other than what you can read and also understand. I hope you will understand until the end, as you have already understood us in part, that on the day of the Lord Jesus, we are your boast, even as you are our boast. Since I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first, so that you might have a double favor. I wanted to visit you on my way back to Macedonia, and to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on to Judea. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to ordinary human standards, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For in him every one of God's promises is a yes. For this reason it is through him that we say the amen to the glory of God. But it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us by putting his seal on us and giving us his spirit in our hearts as a first installment. Our gospel reading is from Mark chapter 11, 27 through 33. Again, they came to Jerusalem. As Jesus was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him and said, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? Answer me. They argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But shall we say of human origin? They were afraid of the crowd, for all regarded John as truly a prophet. So they answered him, Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed as who, ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love. For they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions according to your steadfast love. Remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast, love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Few are they that, tear, that fear the Lord. He will teach them the way that they should choose. 
They will abide in prosperity, and their children shall possess the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my life and deliver me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all its troubles. And our final psalm today is Psalm 91. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you. No scourge come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on a lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I, I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sometimes it's just nice to hear these words read and, uh, and just kind of let them wash over. Um, and and I'm, I'm intrigued the Again, I keep using that word intrigued. I'm, I'm always amazed to see how the different passages of Scripture really do relate to one another. Um, I'm thinking about what Paul was writing in 1 Corinthians and then how Mark uh, was describing how Jesus was interacting with the authorities. Right. And there seems to be this ongoing problem that humans have on who is really in control, right. who has ultimate authority. And everything that scripture is informing us you know from from creation to redemption god is the one who is the authority right. he just is god does give authority to humans to accomplish certain things obviously but um but paul uh writes to the people about how it's it's god who is working through the various situations that are occurring um jesus is telling the uh, the, the scribes and the Pharisees and all of these people when they ask them, well, who, who gave you the authority to do these things? And what's funny about it to me is authority to do what? To heal? Right. To, to, do, good to do good things? He's not doing bad things. He's not doing bad things. Like, well, who, who needs authority to do good things? Who needs authority to heal? Um, and so it seems like, it seems rather odd that they are more concerned with his disruption of their ordinary Right. But, but then says, ultimately, he is the one who has authority to do everything. Right. And that, what I kind of was thinking in, in this context of, of Lent, and we're right here, we're moving through Holy Week, and we start with Palm Sunday and this celebration, and we go from this celebration to we're only a few days away from Jesus' death. And, and it's, I mean, that's a, that's a big difference, celebrating him coming in as a king, to hang him on a cross and watching him die, but he wasn't the king they thought he was going to be all along. And the Pharisees, they're questioning him because he's got this humility about him. And instead of him being boastful and pride and, and being one of them, like, come join us because look, we're, we're the righteous. You can be part of us. 
and he he didn't allow them to do that and and he did he healed the lowly he interacted with the lowly and it's it's like they just couldn't get their mind wrapped around the fact that he is king he does have authority right he didn't do it the way we thought he would do it right. in the same way even Paul when he writes right. and he is encouraging and he is telling them that all of these things are coming through Christ but it's always amazing to me that that had to be written over and over and over and over again. Right. Even though we saw the miracles he performed and the things he did and with the authority that he spoke and accomplished things. And so I just think it boils down to he didn't do it our way, which of course he didn't do it our way. He's God. But us and our own human arrogance think that we can somehow put him into this pattern or this mold and, and he was supposed to do it the way that right. they thought he should do it and he didn't right that that second corinthians passage is, is so haunting where paul's whole point in that was that they were so utterly crushed unbearably crushed that they despaired of life itself so that they would not rely on themselves but on god who raises from the dead and in our culture today, we are so self-reliant. We are so, uh, uh, we spend our entire life, our entire education, our entire career trying to demonstrate how I don't need anybody else's help. Right. I've got these things. I've accomplished these things. I'm gonna hold on to these things. And, and Paul is saying, actually, no, it's totally different. And, and he's writing this to the church in Corinth, these people who were, were really no different than we are in terms of their human attitudes and desires and all of that kind of stuff. I don't think human nature's really changed in that regard. But this whole idea of needing to be dependent on God. And I, and I think, you know, we're, people all talk about, yes, I wanna go to heaven, all these kind of things. It's like, I wanna be with God forever, but, but they've been acting throughout their lives as if they don't really need God. Right. That's that's funny because that's one of the things I'm actually about to go to my office and write about. Oh, yeah? <laughs> and I had a conversation not long ago and talking about that very thing that all throughout, from the time our kids are little, we teach them, you know, you, you are responsible. You take this on. You work hard. You can accomplish things. You're going to pull your, your very American idea. You're going to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And you can do this. Right. And you do it all and you depend on yourself. And we don't look to God until we go, oh, we're in too deep. We can't fix it. We are crushed where there is no other option. And then it's like, oh, we need the bench player. Come on. But he's not the bench player. Mm -hmm. He's the one who should be out there going before us and yet we push him aside until we go oh I can't do this right and then we call him in and he should have been there he should have been there all along right and so mm -hmm. definitely very much the mentality that I think most Christians have they handle life until it's too much and then oh then we have to pray right then we have to why try. is that not the first thing that we turn to why is God not uh, the primary actor in our own lives. Um, that that whole uh, end of that Second Corinthians passage. This whole um, you know, were we vacillating in what we were teaching or all these things? And with humans, it's yes, yes, and no, no simultaneously. It's like how is that not true in our own political climate today? How is that not true with the people that were questioning Jesus and his authority? Because again, it's this whole idea of, well, if we say John was from heaven, then then why did we not believe Jesus? But if we say John was only, you know, with a with a man, you know, uh, power and stuff, because well, they all feared because everyone believed that John was a real prophet, and so they're playing to the crowd. They they want to answer in a way uh, where where you know they maintain their own power structure regardless of the truth and how 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 Paul says in Second Corinthians is. Well, you know, that's just the normal way humans interact, right? Well, yes, yes, or no, no, at the same time. But that whole idea that with Jesus, it's always yes, because he is the one in authority. He is the one that's going to accomplish the, his will. He is the one that has promises and blessings for us. 
He is the one that disciplines us if we turn away. He is the one. All of that is yes in Christ. And sometimes the yes in Christ means he's going to say no to other things in our life. <laughs> but I think that's, that's important to remember. Just because yes. you invoke the name of Jesus doesn't mean that everything that you do is going to be yes. It's yes in Christ. It's yes with him being in authority. Right. It's yes with him fulfilling his promises. It's yes with him accomplishing everything that God wants in our lives. And when we think about the uh, the Psalm 91 passage that we even read, if we remember that Psalm 91 is the is the psalm that the devil uh, misappropriated in the temptations of Jesus. Not that Psalm 91 wasn't true, but it is true within the authority that God has and the and the purposes that He wants to accomplish in our lives. And so. Uh, it's just it's it's so great to know that the promises of God are true, and in Jesus, uh, it's always yes. And the truth is not Christ's truth is not subjective. Mm. It doesn't change right. the circumstances, and it doesn't change it doesn't pander to the crowd. Right. Jesus' truth is true. It's not subjective. Right. Right. Jesus engages in political things, but he himself has the authority over all of politics. Jesus engages with the brokenness of humanity, but with Jesus, it's all about transforming our lives into that we would be the people he wants us to be. Uh, what a great promise, uh, especially as we are on Tuesday of Holy Week, and as we know we're approaching the cross, as we're approaching the uh, just the overwhelming terribleness of, of human sin and depravity, but recognizing that, that Jesus engaged in that not because he was uh, unaware of or fleeing from it or just got overwhelmed by circumstances, but but engaged it intentionally because with Jesus it's always, yes, I am going to do what I am going to do. Wow, that's so great. That's good. Anything else you wanted to add or anything? No, I think okay. that's good. Well, all right. Well, again, thank you uh, for joining us today. Um, there's so much in here, and I really encourage everyone who's listening to uh, to be regularly reading God's Word and trusting that the Holy Spirit will be revealing to you uh, a, a good interpretation, a right interpretation. And as you are, as we are, asking God to be uh, increasingly uh, authoritative over every aspect of our lives, you know, not just the Sunday morning stuff, but the, the Sunday through Saturday from creation to Sabbath, as we are asking God to be more authoritative over every aspect of our lives. I pray, I hope and pray that you will do the same. Continue to read God's word, ask for him to transform you, and he will be faithful to do so. Let me go ahead and close this in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word to us. Thank you for this discussion that Natalie and I were able to have. Uh, thank you for revealing to us through your Holy Spirit that which you would have us to learn from you today. I know, Lord, that every day we fall short, uh, we sin against you, and I'm so grateful for your love and for your mercy and for your grace that you extend to us each and every day. Lord, continue to transform us. Let us be the people that you want us to be. And as we reflect upon your word, let us see how everything in your word uh, impacts every aspect of our lives. Lord, we're grateful. We look forward to um, continuing to be in your presence and having your authority rule and reign over us. And we thank you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Lord willing. Blessings. Bye. Bye.